All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are in 1 Thessalonians, and I'd like to take a moment, and I'm going to assume that you already watched the video that gave you the backdrop for the boxes for 1 Thessalonians, which is essentially two boxes. One is the biographical and relational part of verses uh, of chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then in chapter 4, he changes to from what he's doing to an instructional part in chapters 4 and 5 and gives essentially five instructions that he pulls out over uh, what a believer should be like. I'd like to go back now and I'd like to cite for you the Randy Reading in the White Space's irreducible minimum. The irreducible minimum idea is this, if you've forgotten. When you boil something down, what you're looking for is the essence of it. I am not suggesting that the words we don't underline in this are unimportant. I'm suggesting that if you underline the backbone issue, you can follow it really quickly and it will help you understand it. So when someone asks you a question about verse 10 of chapter 1, you can tell them where that fits in the discussion. Without bones, everything's jellyfish, right? And so what I need to do is put some bones inside this, um, inside this account. So I'm going to give you what I have underlined. I have two versions of it in front of me and they're not the same and I did both. That is to say, this is not the right way to do it. It's the best way I think I'll remember it. And over time, it changes, all right? I want you to, if you're underlining what I did, I'll try to go over it slowly and make sure that you can. But we're going to push from chapter 1 all the way through to the end of chapter 3, okay? Everybody, pencils ready. We're all set to go. Okay. I would underline the following. In verse 1, Paul... Sylvanus and Timothy to the church of Thessalonica or of the Thessalonians grace and peace verse 2 we thank God for all of you I use part of the thanks we thank God for all of you verse Five, our gospel come in power with conviction. Verse 6, you became imitators. Verse 7, you became example to believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Verse 8. The word of the Lord sounded from you in every place. Faith gone forth. That's chapter 1. Let me read it back to you to see if we all have the same thing. Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, to Church of the Thessalonians, grace and peace. We thank God for all, uh, for you, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Verse 5, our gospel come in power with conviction. Verse 6, you became imitators. Verse 7, you became example to believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Verse 8, word of the Lord sounded from you. Um, verse 8 goes on and says, uh, faith has gone forth, or however you want to say that. And that's the end of what I did. Chapter 2, verse 1, our coming was not Vain, or not in vain, if you want the in. Verse 3, our exhorta exhortation, not error. Verse 5, we never came flattering. Verse 6, nor seek glory. Verse 7, we gentle. 
Okay, it's not the best grammar, but we gentle. We be gentle. Okay, verse 9. You recall our labor and hardship. Verse 10, you are witnesses. We behaved. Verse 12, so that you walk worthy. Verse 13, we thank God you received the word of God. Verse 14, you became imitators of churches of God. Also in verse 14, endured sufferings. Verse 18, we wanted to come to you. Let me go over chapter 2 again. Our coming to you, not in vain. Verse 1. Verse 3, our, exhorta our exhortation, not error. Verse 5, we never came flattering. Verse 6, nor seek glory. Verse 7, we gentle, or we be gentle. Verse 9, you recall our labor and hardship. Verse 10, you witnesses, we behaved. Verse 12, so that you walk worthy. Verse 13, thank God you received the word of God. Verse 14, you became imitators of churches, endured sufferings. Verse 18, we wanted to come to you. Let's go on to chapter 3. Chapter 3, therefore, verse 1, we, verse 2, sent Timothy. Verse 4, we kept telling you, going to suffer affliction. Uh, we were going to suffer affliction. We kept telling you we were going to suffer affliction. Sorry. End of verse 4, it came. Verse 5, I sent to find out about your faith. Verse 6, Timothy has come to us and brought us good news. Verse 7, we were comforted. Verse 9, thanks to God. Let's go back to the beginning of the verse and let's just discuss for a few moments what it is he's doing in the letter. He writes the first section of the letter to be personal, biographical, relational. And this is the first of the letters that Paul writes that we have in the New Testament. And he starts off by explaining to them um, some of the principles of a good testimony in verses 1 through 10. And he says that in verses 1 through 3, that um, they gave thanks to God for them. And he says that there are some faithfulness of the people that encourages him. So he says, we're so thankful that we have you. We mention you in prayer. We, we constantly bear in mind the way that you have become steadfast. The basic idea was this. The benefit of sharing the faith of Jesus Christ is that when people respond, we see them walking in steadfastness, and as a result, we are, we are celebrating you. It is a good thing for believers who are making disciples to celebrate every good thing those disciples are doing. You should be the cheerleader of the people you are discipling. Okay? When you get down to verse 4, <clears throat> verses 4 and 5, he, he, he raises the standard. He says... I, I understand that you're loved of God and that God chose you, verse 4, but our gospel did not come just in word. It was powerful. It brought conviction. And we know that you know what kind of men we were. We were not coming to you boldly and powerfully. We were coming to you, can I use this word, wordly. We came with the word and the word did the work. And you know the word did the work because you know it wasn't us. Is it possible to bring the gospel with such glitzy methodology that you overpower the gospel with what looks like human manipulation? Answer, yes. 
better to present the, the simple facts of the message of the scriptures than to do it with all the glitz. Look, nothing we're doing today is very glitzy. You're sitting there, you've got a Bible open, and I'm talking to you. This is not the most innovative way to communicate. Here's the bottom line. The Word has its own power. It does the transformation. I don't have to light myself on fire to get you to see it. The Spirit of God speaks within you and you go, you know what, that's true. You know what, that's right. You know, I should be doing that. You know, that's convicting. That hits me here and here and I, I need to change my relationships. That happens in you not because of my ability to somehow manipulate the crowd, but because the Word comes in power. One of the things he says is that, verse 6, that right away they became imitators. That word mimitai is the word from which we get mimic. But it's also a word that is used for the making or striking of coins. Ancient coins were actually struck. So what you did was you took the small round and you actually created the impression stamp and you struck the coin. The important thing about the striking of the coin is that lots of people were making fakes. And Thessaloniki was an area where they were minting coins and they were coming up with fakes. And so he calls on them to be actual imitations or actual struck images, real, um, real coins as opposed to knockoffs or counterf counterfeits, real Christians as opposed to fake Christians. And so he uses the term become imitators of us. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. You receive the word with much tribulation. In other words, it's not a guarantee that when you believe the truth, good things will happen to you. When you believe the truth, often people will come on against you. You receive this, but notice in verse 7, you became an example for believers all over the place, both in Macedonia or northern Greece and, and, and Achaia or what we would call southern Greece. He says, look at the impact that you've had. The word of the Lord sounded forth from you in verse 8. And now it goes every place that your, your faith toward God has gone forth. We don't have to say anything. We say, hey, have you heard about the church in Thessalonica? And almost everybody we run into goes, yes, we have. They have an incredible faith. They have an incredible message. When God is at work in a place, people around it will know. You don't have to put up a big billboard. They'll know. It's kind of like being in love. When you really are, we'll know. You don't have to come in and go, I just love her. We'll know, okay? Now, in verse 9, it says that people are reporting what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a true and living God. He says, listen, one of the things that people will say is, wow, what a change happened in your life. Your life used to be about this, and now it's diametrically opposed to what it used to be as you come to follow Christ. And verse 10 says that, that they're eagerly expecting Jesus' return from heaven and that you knew he was raised from the dead, and that he rescues us from the wrath to come. You have been so dramatically changed, everyone around you pays attention to it. I think one of the things he's trying to capture in chapter 1 is, I am so incredibly blessed by the fact that your life was powerfully changed by God through his word, not through anything we did, and we saw you change, and as a result, we walk around with our life being lifted because we see change in you. Chapter 2, he doesn't know it's going to be at chapter 2. It's just a continuation of the letter when he writes it. But in chapter 2, you see some template for an impact for the gospel. What is the template? What is the model for impact for the gospel? And it says that um, it, when it came, it came with a commitment. He says, when we came to you, it wasn't an empty uh, coming. Yes, we were mistreated in Philippi, and you all know what that was about, right? They were beaten, thrown in jail. We just saw that. And we came with the boldness in our God to speak the gospel amid much opposition. We were already familiar with the fact that the gospel upsets people. We just got out of prison. But when we walked in, we were going to do this anyway because our commitment was to bring the gospel to you. Now, what's interesting is look at the focus he has in verse 3. Our exhortation doesn't come from error or impurity or deceit. Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Our focus wasn't on whether it was popular. It wasn't on wh whether or not people around us brought it and accepted it willingly. It didn't become true because people believed it. It was already true. Our focus was on the fact that God had made clear what the gospel was, and we were going to just tell you the truth whether you liked it or not, really. And verse 5 says, we never came with flattering speech. We, we didn't want to come and, 
and craft our message in such a way that we were so um, manipulative in the way that we spoke. Look at verse 5 and make a note of this. It's not wrong for you to try to not be offensive in your message. Don't get up and offend everybody and call that Christ. But also don't try to back up on what's true just so you can get a hearing with people. Speak the truth, always in love, but speak the truth. He said, we didn't come with flattering words. We also didn't seek the glory of men. We weren't looking to become popular. There is too much going on in the church right now, guys, where people want the church to somehow be embraced by this culture and popular again. Guess what? We're not going to be. They're not going to love us if we preach Christ clearly. If we preach a mamby-pamby Christ that wants to just give you soup in your pot, everybody will come. If he wants to give you healing and prosperity, everybody will come. But when we preach repentance, people are going to hate that. They always have. So we've got to say what's true and not say it just to be popular. There's nothing in our commission from God that says, let's get Jesus voted to be Messiah. This is not a, some kind of um, American idol message where we try to get more votes this is we preach the truth and we don't worry however do we come with with heavy hands look at verse 6 it says even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority we didn't come that way we proved gentle among you a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children I think that honestly sensitivity to people reaches people and insensitivity just makes people mad at you so you come in and you say what's true, but there's two ways to say what's true. You, I can walk in and go, you are all sinners and bound for hell. Well, that's true. It's probably not going to get you heard. Or I could say, you know, the Bible says that every one of us is broken and every one of us is sinful. Me, you, all of us. And the Bible says that every one of us deserves to be completely set aside by God because we rejected him. We followed after another. It's like blaming the woman who comes home and finds her husband in bed with somebody else for kicking him out. It's his fault, not hers. She just walked in the door. And so, so if you can say it in a sensitive way, you can say the exact same thing without being frontally offensive, right? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you come as a, as a tender, uh, gentle person? The other thing I think is, look at verse 8. He doesn't just come with a methodology of, of, of gentleness. He comes with a heart attitude of fondness. People know if you disdain them. If you walk in and go, you sinner. You know, the, the, you look like you're sucking green persimmons or something. Here's the thing. If you walk through the door and say they're homosexuals, yeah, that's not going to reach them. How about you start off by saying we're all broken. Your area of brokenness is different than my area of brokenness, but we're all broken. What we can't do is license your brokenness as it's really okay. We can't do that, but we don't have to be mean about it. There's a very nice way to say, no, I think what you're doing is manifesting brokenness. And honestly, in a few years, just wait. It's going to be why Jesus really loves pedophiles and they shouldn't be required to not be. There's going to be this continual lack of logic like it's unloving to make a judgment about anything ever. You're discriminating. We discriminate all the time in our society. Okay? We, as a society, discriminate against rapists. We put them in jail. Well, that's very judgy. Yes, it is. It's called a justice system. That's why we do that. We really, really have a strong, strong bend away from people who perform armed robberies. Now, you may be offended because you may really like them or feel strongly about them, but we have decided as a society to throw them in jail. And that's discrimination. Discrimination is when you treat somebody differently. We discriminate against people who do things that we think are illegal. Here's the thing. We need to be careful as Christians that we come with a sense of fondness toward people. And I think in verse 8, he imparted the gospel and his life. You don't just give your message, you give yourself to them. You actually become somebody that's a part of their life. Don't just share the gospel as a kind of hitman for Jesus, you know, so you can put kill marks on your car. That's not the idea. This is not bomb them for Jesus, baby. 
This is like, you know what, I'm going to give myself to walking into this community and being part of it. You know what that requires? It requires a certain level of humility. Because when you're speaking truth into somebody's life, you're already looking like you're on a higher plane than them. So if you don't at least come softly, it's going to look like you're walking and going, I have the answer to life. Now be seated and I shall tell it to you. Okay? That's not really going to reach people. Now what's interesting is in verse 9 it says, when you watched us, what kind of labor did we have? Well, if you looked at us closely, you'll know that we behaved in a blameless way towards you in verse 10. And we exhorted, we encouraged, we implored each of you, but we did it like a father does for his children. We did it relationally. We became in a relationship with you, and that's how we spoke into your life. You know, now what I find interesting is how long was he there? Less than a month. See, this isn't written after Paul had spent years with them. This is written after he was there less than a month. And then he got kicked out. So in a matter of a month, Paul moved into an area and became relationally attached to them. We got missionaries that show up on the field and after four years don't have three friends. There's something wrong, okay? You need to make friends among people in order to have an influence in their life. You do not win an enemy to Jesus. You win a friend to Jesus. So what do you do? You make friends of people that you know need Jesus. But you make a genuine friend. Don't just go and talk at them. Listen to them. What is it about their life that you didn't know when you arrived? See, Christians that are smart will arrive into a situation where they're going to share the gospel and they'll say, what can I learn from these people, not just what can I tell them? If you want to tell them, it looks like you're coming and throwing up the gospel on them. I mean, they, they really want you to share their life. I love, 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 love cross-cultural ministry because I love new food, big on new food, really big on new food. Did I mention it? I love new food? But I also really enjoy the way people think around the globe is not the same. And I get challenged to think differently when I'm sitting there listening. I want you to see the beauty in people. And what I see him saying is that when you look at what we were, when you look at how we behaved, we behaved in a way that was tender and real and sensitive and related and a part of your life. Now, he then turns it and says, we came, you know, doing all this, but we did it with a purpose in verse 12, that you would walk worthy of the manner of what God called you toward. That's that, that's that image of the slave market. You remember? In the slave market, the slaves are stood up. They're brought in in the market on a platform. They're totally nude, and they have only one thing hanging around their neck, and that's a titulus. And the titulus is a sign that says, I speak uh, German and French, and I do windows, okay, whatever it says, you know, and you stand there and they just kind of move you around like this and people examine you physically and then they stop and then people bid on you based on your titulus. But when you are purchased, you have to walk worthy to what is written on the sign. If you, they sold you saying you could speak German and you can't, then you're not worthy of what they paid for you. Does that make sense? So that's the imagery he uses here. He says, Jesus paid for you. Now walk according to what it is he called you to be, worthy of what God paid for you, verse 13. And I want to thank God because you received the word, but you heard it, you accepted this, this and it's, it's also showing itself in the lifestyle that you have, and you became just like the churches in Judea. You imitated them because you got in trouble just like they did. Almost immediately when you came to faith, trouble came down on you. That's just like what happened in Judea. And he says, um, they killed the Lord Jesus. They killed the prophets, verse 15. They drove us out. They were not pleasing to God. They're hostile. They're hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. He says, look, wrath has come upon them. Now, do you remember that wrath, the, the wrath of God has come upon them is a way of saying what? What's the other word for that wrath that's come upon them? He's talking about from Judea, who lives in Judea, Jews, and what is the wrath that's come upon them? The shame, the judicial blindness that's come upon them, that Joel talks about. So he's saying, like Joel too, that this is the wrath of God that's come upon them, that a judicial blindness has come for a time. It will be taken back from them, 
but not until God is done with it. And he says in verse 17, brethren, we've come, <clears throat> having been taken away from you for a short while. We're not there in person, but we're there in spirit. And we're eager to see you. I really wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. How did Satan hinder them? Verse 18. Every time I wanted to come to you, it became clear that Satan hindered us. What was the hindrance of Satan? Well, it may have been more than this, but at least we know one hindrance. What was it? The bond that was put on his cousin Jason that could have been thrown in prison every time he showed up in town. So he knew every time they, that he wanted to come, people would get word that he wanted to come. They would threaten him again, and he had to back off. And he said, who is our hope, our joy, our crown, our exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus that is coming? I am so looking forward to introducing you physically to Jesus. I introduced you spiritually, and I am so excited that when Jesus comes, and he's going to come, I'm going to stand there, I'm going to go, so, Lord, look at these from Thessalonica who came to you and stood in a time of persecution. Isn't this great? He says, I'm looking forward to that time. Our reward in front of Jesus is you. I'll be thankful if, if I got no other rewards but that you got into heaven because I preached the gospel to you, I will feel a, a blessed man. Now in chapter 3, he goes on and he says, wait a minute, there was a, a pattern that I learned as a loving leader and I want to share it with you. He, I, I learned that eventually I, could, I was so sensitive about being away from you, I couldn't put up with it anymore, so I had to send somebody. So he says in verse 1 and 2, I couldn't take it anymore, so I sent Timothy. And um, I was very concerned. I was concerned that, that somebody would have disturbed you, that the afflictions would have thrown you off. And I want you to know that, that, that we were in a very, we, we, we were telling you from the very beginning that trouble was going to come. You believe in Jesus? We weren't preaching health, wealth, and prosperity. We were preaching persecution. We told you from the beginning that if you believed, you'd be persecuted. And guess what? In verse five, 4, it came. That persecution came. It came against us. It came against you. But I had to send to find out about your faith. Even though I couldn't be there, verse 5 says, I had to send to, to get a, a message about your faith. Now, Timothy came to us, verse 6, and he brought us this really good news about your faith and your love. And I got to tell you, we were so comforted in verse 7. When we heard that you're growing in faith in spite of persecution, we went, yay, God, way to go. You're reaching these people. You're changing these people. And now we really live. Verse 8, I can rest. I can sleep. I am so happy. If you stand firm in the Lord, I can go on. I was so burdened by it. You know what I love about that? I love that Paul wasn't just talking he was moved by what God was doing in them. And then he says, um, verse 9, What thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy which we rejoice before God on your account? He said, I am so overwhelmed with God's goodness. I just am thanking God day and night. I don't even know how to say to him, God, what a great God you are that you've reached these people and you've made them strong in spite of everything that happened. And then he gives him a bit of a benediction as he closes the first part of the letter. Do you notice how verse 11 through 13 sort of tells you that he's ending a section and he's going to start something new? It's almost like he, he got to chapter 3, he got that far in the letter and he took a break, went away for lunch or something. He said, before I close this celebration section and this personal and biographical section, I want you to know, I want God to be your father himself. And I want the Lord Jesus to direct our way back to you. And I want the Lord to cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. I want you to love other people as well. I want him to establish your hearts. I want you to walk in a way that's holy. And, and I want you to walk before the sight of God. And I want you to do that all the way until Jesus comes. And I want you to, to, to celebrate with me that God is going to transform you. So he kind of closes it off with a nice benediction, if you will, before he moves to chapters 4 and 5. 